In episode 74 of MobyCast, we continue with part two of our series on encryption. In particular, we discuss transport layer security in practice. Welcome to MobyCast, a weekly conversation about cloud-native development, AWS, and building distributed systems. Let's jump right in. Welcome, Chris and Rich. It's another episode of MobyCast. Hey. Hey, guys. Good to be back. Yeah, good to have you back. So, Rich, what have you been up to? Oh, so you had recommended a book called Managing Humans. So I was asking you about how to start the learning process of becoming more of a manager than a practitioner. And so that book came so yesterday. Fun. So, so I'll be planning to read that this week and weekend, hopefully. Great. Yeah, let me know what you think. Um, it's definitely, yeah, on a, a Slack group that I'm a part of called Rand Slack. It's a popular read. Everybody recommends it. How about you, Chris? What are you up to? Speaking of books, I am working through a book called Bitcoin Billionaires. Kind of very appropriate considering the topics we've been discussing here on MobiCast the last yeah, the last total. few episodes. Yeah, so um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, definitely in line with encryption. So Bitcoin, and you know, it's it's a kind of a fascinating story. It's it's kind of like the revenge of the Winklevi in a way, but also you know, the book is written by Ben Mesrick, who wrote the Accidental Billionaires, which is the book that the movie The Social Network was based on, right? So it's all about how Facebook started, you know, it's Genesis story, right? And, and a big I part of that. that. It was so fun. Yeah. yeah and, the movie it was. Was fun and, too. and the movie is too. Jesse Eisenberg just, just nails it. It's mm-hmm. like, that's the, to me, that's the true Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so that was the the first and it and it really didn't come in away from that that book and that movie the winkle the winkle of the boss twins didn't really come off looking so great and so this book is it's really again by the same author kind of comes you know sees what happens after the fallout from that and you know they did have a settlement with facebook so they received some amount of of financial settlement but they this is they they really got in early in into bitcoin and you know, around 2011, 2012, and before anyone else really, really jumped on that bandwagon, and they ended up buying a lot. I mean, they really went in, went in big time. They they saw this as a as a really big opportunity. They really believe that this is the future for currency and for financial models. And parts of it read a bit like a a spy spy novel. The measures that they go to protect the Bitcoin that they've purchased is is pretty impressive you know with with bitcoin you're you pick a private key to basically protect your your coin and and that's all you need right to to have to to say this 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 bitcoin is mine so that private key is really really important so they kind of talk about like how they went and generated this private key to really make sure that it's completely random which by the way they didn't even trust computers they went out and bought a 20 set of die from like Dungeons and Dragons game and, and enrolled that to come up with with something that they felt was was random enough. And then that private key that they did generate, they broke it up into three separate pieces, printed it out on pieces of paper, made four copies of that, and then got on planes and then just jetted around the US and put these pieces of paper inside safe deposit box at various different banks and locations mm-hmm. so that that they felt this was the best the best way to keep it safe so pretty 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 interesting story definitely recommend it very cool so yeah i mean they they're talking about keeping their private key safe and we're talking about encryption and yeah maybe you can talk a little bit about what we discussed last week because this week we're going to go into encryption and practice so it's going to be based on everything we learned from last week and we're going to get into you know the details of how how those things we learned last week are used in practice and the stuff that we as software developers do every day Right. Yeah. So, so last week, so this is a multi-part, multi-part series on encryption. Last week was about the essentials. So we went through kind of like the essential pieces of encryption being hashing and then the two main categories of encryption, uh, symmetric encryption and uh, public key encryption. And so hashing is that, that one way function that given an input generates an output and given the output, it's, it's really not possible to, to go backwards from that. Right. And so that lays the basis for things like signing things, um, verifying identity, authentication, if you will. And it's also the backbone of some of the, the cryptography algorithms from, a, from just from a math, math standpoint. The two cryptography categories, they're symmetric. Symmetric involves a single key 
And that key is need, it needs to be known for both encrypting and decrypting. So both parties involved in the, the secure communications need to have that key. And so a lot of the challenges around that is how do you securely share that key and, and ensure that no one else has it. And then public key encryption is, is also known as asymmetric key encryption. And this, this involves two keys. It, it's a key pair. So there's a public part of it and there's a private part of it. And this gets around that problem of having to share a secret between two parties Instead, it's a party that wants to allow people to and other parties to communicate to it securely publishes a public key. And that's a key that people, other parties use to encrypt the message that they want to send. And then it has the private key and the private key is only known to to that party. And the private key is, re, is the only is required in order to decrypt the message. So the the only party that can actually do the decryption is the one with the private key. And then you can have the 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 byway communication by just reversing that. So so those are the the three main things we talked about last time. And so today we're going to kind of dive a little bit deeper and say, well, okay, how does this encryption work in real life? Like, what are some of the the actual examples of it? We'll go into two particular examples today. One being TLS, and then another one is a. Uh, an end-to-end encryption SDK that allows for secure point-to-point messaging between two or, or more parties and, and not just the, the one-to-one communication, but like what happens when you want to go to one-to-many or many-to-many communication? Like, how does that work? So we'll be doing that today. Great. Yeah, I guess we'll start with TLS. And I think that, you know, just to, to help everyone, because I think most people maybe still say HTTPS. But when you say HTTPS, you're talking about TLS. So go ahead and talk about TLS. Right. Yeah. And it, it's actually it's part of that that networking layer stack. Mm-hmm. So T- TLS stands for Transport Layer Security. So it's actually built into the OC, OSI network model. Mm-hmm. And HTTPS is, is at the application level. So that's layer seven. TLS is down at the uh, transport layer. So it's uh, level four. Right. Um, Right, but um, I mean, let's just kind of get the the thing out there. Like, yeah, they're the same, really, in sort of general nomenclature. No one's gonna. Well, there are a few people that will hold you, your head over a barrel if you get those wrong, but those people are not cool. <laughs> yeah, the the maybe the other thing, maybe the point that's that's a little confusing too is SSL, right? So people will confuse TLS with SSL, and mm-hmm. SSL is the one that has been deprecated. This is not, we don't use SSL anymore. TLS has, has superseded it. Okay. Um, yeah. Which was kind of a, at the same level as TLS, right? So secure sockets layer versus TLS, the transport layer security. So yeah, so let's, so so, T, so TLS basically is the backbone for how do we have secure communications over the internet? And specifically, you know, how do we, how do we trust, you know, other parties and make sure that that whole communication is indeed secure without really knowing you know who who they are and whatnot so there's there's three main components to tls so one is authentication and so authentication is really like i need to be able to make sure that who i am talking to is who i think it is right that's that's really important because if you know you could go ahead and set up a secure channel between yourself and some other party but if they're pretending to be someone else, well, then you now you just sent all your private, you know, secure data to, you know, some hacker or some spoof site or whatnot. So authentication is a, is a, is a key part of this. And then, of course, encryption. Right. So once that once that channel is set up, we want to make sure that the, the messages are encrypted and can only be read by the two parties. And then the third part of it is integrity. So integrity is all about making sure that the the message that's been sent hasn't been tampered with. So there hasn't been someone in the middle that, that's altered that message as well. So those are the three components that we'll talk about. Well, it's kind of, I mean, so we, we've been talking about encryption and we'll, we'll spend the bulk of the time with that. But for completeness, it is kind of interesting to talk about the, the other parts of, of TLS, especially the authentication part, because this is, this is really a key part of how the web and and https works you know just from your from your browser and so we uh, yeah simply, i guess this is the part that i don't know about so keep going mm-hmm. i'm kind of i've got this confused look on my face like what is he going to say here <laughs> go ahead <laughs> right yeah i mean well this is this is back in the day why you had to pay you know 400 dollars a year for an ssl certificate 
And, you know, nowadays it's, it's much, much easier. And, you know, folks like Amazon, they do them for free as long as you run them on their, on their, their services. So these SSL certs are kind of the way that the web does, does identity and authentication to verify like who it is that you're, you're talking to. So it, it itself relies on public key encryption. So there is just just like what we talked about with 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 public key encryption there's a there's a public part of that key and then there's the private part of that key and there's a middleman between these digital certificates right so so a server that wants to do so a web server that wants to serve up secure traffic it needs to generate its own ssl certificate so this is a it's a digital certificate it's essentially it's a unique id that indicates that server right there's a middleman, which is the certificate authority. Mm-hmm. And the certificate authority is the one that's responsible for issuing these certificates. Mm-hmm. And it's the one that's going to verify, guarantee the identity of those, those certificates, right? So the, the, the certificate authority is going to confirm the identity of that web server. The, and the, so like in the case of AWS, like really they're just verifying that you have a billing relationship with them, right? Like AWS, you sign up for an account, you give them a credit card, and they're like, "Okay, yeah, you, you, you're at least known enough to me that we're I'm taking money from you, and then I'm going to give you a certificate based on that." That's definitely a big part of it. The other big part of it, right, is the verifying that you actually own the domain. Mm-hmm. So they'll have you do things like, um, <laughs> but if you, you know, buy the domain from AWS, then it's still kind of the one thing, right? They will do. They, they know. <laughs> yeah, I mean they'll they'll do the steps automatically for you, right? So like right. A, a lot a way a lot of these certificate authorities do it will they'll they'll use DNS. So they'll require you to go update your DNS records to put in a, a text record for some specific secret or or just unique ID that they that they're going to use for that particular identity verification process. Right. And right. Yeah. So Amazon makes it really easy, right? Because they have their own DNS, Route 53. And so when you go and, and create one of these certs, there's a, a little thing that just says like, hey, would you like us to go ahead and do this for you automatically? And so then they update your, your Route 53 and then they can do all that verification very quickly. Yeah. And I'm not really getting at the technology behind it. I'm kind of actually getting more at like the policy behind it. So and sort of by verifying that you have a billing relationship with them, AWS is kind of offloading the know who you are part of identity management to your credit card company, right? So your credit card company is responsible for vetting you as a business or as a person. And then if you can produce a credit card number that works with AWS, then AWS is like, great, somebody out there has vetted you. So I'll sell you a domain. I'll give. I'll let you hook it up in Route 53. I'll then sell you a certificate and all of that, all your whole identity checking is just based on the fact that I've established a billing relationship with you. I, I'm, this is this is kind of me just guessing, but like it's that easy, right? Like there's nobody calling you. There's nobody, you know, giving you an interview to make sure that you have the number of pl- employees you said. Like that's what it used to be. And at this point, I don't think it, it's anything beyond that billing relationship. Yeah, I mean, so specifically for AWS, it's 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 much easier now to do that that identity mm-hmm. process. I I, mean, I know in the past, like when I did it with with folks like Network Solution, Network Solutions or or Verisign, it would be a multi day process where you would have to have like you know provide like a phone bill with a company address mm-hmm. on it, you know, type thing. You so it was just it was it was a more manual process for for checking this. So I think yeah, I mean, AWS is definitely streamline the process. I think they've kind of said, I mean, they have probably other ways too of, of kind of automating like identity verification and sure. you know, who, who knows like what, what databases they're tapping into as well. So, right. And if I were to speculate, I guess I would just, I would say, wow, it seems like it'd be really easy to create a fraudulent certificate. You know, you're a bad, bad actor and you want to, you want an HTTP certificate, HTTPS, you know, a TLS certificate. You can get one pretty easily, but you know, maybe more easily than you used to be able to, but it sort of doesn't matter, right? It's like all the things that you need to do to protect your security on the, you know, protect, protect your assets and things on the internet. Like they're just getting harder and harder. So, and it kind of doesn't matter that there used to be a big human process involved. And now it's just kind of quick. Like the, there were so many ways around the human process that, that might as well not even waste people's time with it. I guess that's kind of what I'm saying. That's my speculation. Like now mm-hmm. all of this is easy, but protecting yourself, has, has just gotten harder. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, all this doesn't preclude someone from going and registering the domain Yahoo spelled Y-O-U instead of mm-hmm. Y-O-O, right? And, like, that's all legit. But if you turn, if you're, if you're just, 
instead like just stealing people's money then that's not a tls problem right, right. That, that, that's right. a that's another problem of just you know fishing and 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 all the other ways that people can can do crime on the on the inner tubes do some crimes yeah <laughs> with a z <laughs> Right. All right, so keep taking um, on this road of this handshake. Right, yeah. So, so the so we have the certificate authority. They're the middleman. They're the ones that is like the trusted trusted party. So when again, when a server wants to be able to do these 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 um, secure communications, it's 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 going through the certificate authority to say, hey, I want I issued the certificate. It keeps it has the public key and the private key to it. The public key goes with the certificate that's available through the C, the, the certificate authority. And the server itself, the private key stays obviously private with it. So this way, when a client wants to talk to that server securely, like one of the things they're going to have to figure out is, okay, what's the what's the public key that I'm going to use a for this? Being like a browser, right? Yes, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to go and and you know look at that certificate. There's some there's some steps there that it needs to do to verify that that certificate is going to be. It's going to trust it. So it's going to, you know, one, verify that the, the, the certificate authority that it's coming from is a trusted CA. It's going to make sure that that certificate is valid. Um, and then, you know, so it's not expired. And then it's also going to make sure that the certificate matches the domain of the web server. So I think we've all seen the, the message in the browser where you go somewhere and get the big warning message saying like, this doesn't, the certificate doesn't match, right? This site. And as developers, we, we may have, you know, we, we try to do this like when we're trying to like test something, right? In our dev environment or, or staging environment, we're trying to use a, a, a SSL certificate and it just doesn't match up with the domain that's being served from. And so that's that's another check that the that the client's going to do. So once it once it does that and it says, yeah, I'm going to trust the certificate. That certificate has the public key part of the certificate, so that it can now start doing this public key encryption to to implement TLS between it and the web server. And so, so this, and this is all part of the TLS handshake. So this TLS handshake happens, you know, at the very beginning, the initiation of a session and it's doing these, these two things. One, it's, it's the server's proving its identity through the SSL certificate. And then after that, the two parties are, are establishing a shared encryption key. So, so this ends up what it is. It's a combination of both symmetric cryptography encryption as well as public key so so what it will do is it will it's going to use the public key encryption so that the two parties the client and the web server can create a shared secret to be used for the symmetric encryption and so we, uh-huh. we talked about right so we, we talked about before like this is a big problem with the symmetric symmetric key encryption is that both parties have to know the secret well, how do you get, how do you, how do you share that secret? Right. And then how do you like, what if you need to revoke it? You know, how do you make sure that no one else has it? And so. Chris, really would you that, believe me if I told you that I've never had this thought before, but at the beginning of this episode, when you were talking about public key encryption and, and the difficulty of sharing keys with symmetric key encryption is like that sharing of the keys. And I was like, Oh, I wonder if you could use public key encryption to share that key. And now you're saying that that's exactly how TLS works. Would you believe me? Sure. I just yeah. had this aha moment earlier in the episode, and now you're telling me that's actually how it works. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How cool. I'm so excited. It's too bad you didn't have that. We couldn't go back 30 years, and you could <laughs> patent that and be right. living on the beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boat trips every weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and that's exactly what happened. So the other thing to think about here is that the public key encryption is much more computationally expensive than symmetric. Exactly. Encryption, yes. Right. right. So that's why I mean, because because I mean, the other question was, well, why don't we just use public key encryption for the whole thing, right? Like, why do we even worry about symmetric encryption? Like, we already solved the problem, so we we already had to do this setting up the secure channel without having a shared secret. So why create a shared secret for this session? And so the reason is, is literally for performance, right? And, and now it takes, takes a little while. You got to be patient. Mm-hmm. But then once you get that symmetric key encryption going, you're blazing. You're going so mm-hmm. fast. Mm-hmm. And it's actually, it's not just performance as well. It's you're, you're creating a, a, a level of indirection. So this way it gives you the, the freedom to revoke who you're talking to and whatnot, right? So the intermediate key is that you decide what kind of lifetime they have. Yeah, I was I was even wondering if the TLS protocol means makes it so that 
as part of creating that shared secret? Like if it's different for every, you know, handshake, right? Like I'm going to do another handshake, I make a new one. I'm do another yeah. handshake, I make another new one. Like just mm -hmm. every time new, it could be. It is. And, and that's, that's what the handshake does. So the handshake, every handshake is one, verify the identity, make sure that we trust that certificate. And then two, we're going to create a, a new encryption key a new symmetric encryption key and set that up and share it. And then for the remainder of that session, we'll, we don't need to do any of that anymore, right? We're going to use that same symmetric key, but for any new sessions, brand new symmetric key. Cool. Right? So, so it'll all be done again. So lots and lots of these, these symmetric keys, they're just, they're basically just disposable keys. Right on, right on. Hey, this is Rich. Please pardon this quick interruption. We recently passed an internal milestone of 50,000 listens, and I wanted to take a moment to thank you for the support. I was also hoping to encourage you to head over to iTunes and leave us a review and or a rating. Positive feedback and constructive criticism are both incredibly important to us. So give us an idea of how we're doing, and we'll promise to keep publishing new episodes every week. Okay, let's dive back in. So last week we had talked about symmetric key encryption, and I was asking you if you had any way of sort of describing it in an intuitive way, like what's happening in the math of not the math of like why it, why it works, but the math of like how the encryption happens. And we mm -hmm. kind of didn't know off the top of our heads. And so I promised that I would go figure that out and, and tell everybody this week. And so I think this is a good opportunity to, to do that because we just said that TLS creates a symmetric encryption conversation between two parties. I looked it up and we'll, we'll put this in the show notes. There's this moserware.com. I've never heard of it before, but there's a stick figure guide to the AES encryption protocol. And it's really good. It's, it's really kind of long, but uh, it makes it fairly simple to understand what's happening in AES. And I think there's just a couple of things that I want to talk about from it because I, I can't get into the, every single detail. There's literally like 200 boxes of stick figures. So it's going to take you an afternoon to read it. But there's a few principles that I think are worth sharing on Mobicast. So there's first is that there's three big ideas in symmetric key encryption. One is the idea of confusion. And that's that's sort of the secret decoder ring classic thing of like, I'm going to change every letter by increasing it by three. So A becomes D and T becomes W and C becomes F. That's confusion. And if you can imagine like, there's more than one way to do that. You don't just have to move up or down the alphabet by a certain number. You could, there's lots of things. And, and in fact, since every kind of character or every part of a computer message is not necessarily an English letter, in fact, it's definitely not, it's actually a byte or, you know, a pair of bytes, you can do the math on the bytes. So maybe a byte is like AE or 0F or C1. You can do some math with those bytes to turn that byte into a different byte that you can then reverse later. So C1 might become AF, and then you reverse it, AF goes back to being C1. So that's one part of it. That's the confusion. The other part of it is diffusion. So you, you can imagine like a, a string like attack at dawn, and you could write that all out in one line, or you could write it out in three lines. So the three lines could be line one, A-T-T-A, -T -T -A, line two, C-K-A-T, and line three, D-A-W-N. And if you wrote that in three lines, then all of a sudden, instead of reading it as rows, like A-T-T-A -T -T -A is row one, you could be like, I'm gonna actually encrypt it by by doing the columns instead. So the column, the first column is A C D and the next column is T K A. By doing things as columns, you just you just switch the message from saying attack at dawn to A C D T K A T A W A T N. Whoa, that's like that's completely different than the original message. So that's called diffusion. That's kind of like scrambling things up in terms of scrambling the order of the letters in the message. And then the last big idea of symmetric key cryptography is that the secrecy is only in the key. So the secrecy can't be in the method. There can't be something like nobody know, nobody can know that on step three, we're going to switch around the order by, by doing this, this, and this. Like, And that can't be the core of the secret because if the core of the secret is in the method, somebody's going to find out your method someday and then they'll be able to decode everything. The secret has to be in the key. Because then all you have to do is change the key and the method can be, everybody can know the method. And if they don't know the key, there's no way that they can figure out the message. So if you're, if all your secret is in the key, then that's good. And that's why AES keys are like 256 bytes. Like they're really long. And that makes them unguessable. So, and, and then finally, like how does AES actually work? I'm not going to get into the details here, but you can just imagine it's like a game of moving stuff around. 
I'm going to put it in a, I'm going to put the message into a square. And then you know, one step is going to be, I'm going to switch the order of the columns. And another step is going to be, I'm going to take each byte from the square and multiply it or, or actually not multiply it by another byte, but this other operation called XOR. There's a lot of XOR happening. And XOR is like a, an operation that a transistor can do. And it's like, why would you do a bunch of XORing? Well, the reason is because on transistors inside of computer chips, XOR is so, 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 so fast. And that kind of goes back to what you were just saying, Chris, like switching from public key encryption, which requires lots of actual multiplication and things that are slow on chips to AES encryption, which involves a lot of XORing, which is unbelievably fast on chips. Like I, I'm talking like you can probably do on a, on a modern chip, like multiple billion, like three, four, five billion XORs per second means you can just go so fast through messages. You can just encrypt and decrypt like at lightning speed. And then the AES protocol involves like a bunch of XORing, a bunch of shifting bits around, a bunch of re rearranging columns, a bunch of sliding rows over and doing that a whole bunch of times and then undoing it a whole bunch of times. Like enough times that the, the math people out there have essentially proven that to to do this with brute force is is harder than is really possible in the in today with today's computer chips. So that is what I wanted to talk about. Do you have any questions for me about that, Chris? <laughs> no, I don't think. I mean, the I think the way that I kind of wrap my head around it is it's, it's like a Rubik's cube. Yeah. So yeah. you know, you start off with like the the Rubik's cube that's solved and. Then you just start not only just changing the making turns to change the rows and the columns of those squares, but then if you start actually taking the stickers off and putting them on different squares, so yeah. the removing the stickers and put them on other ones, that's the confusion. The mm -hmm. rotating the the cube, the rows and the columns of the cube, that's diffusion. And so you can see how like the input was like the solved cube, and then the output it looks like just a bunch of random colored squares. And that's your that's your encrypted data. To keep our our analogy working, though, like the confusion part, you can't just be switching stickers at random. You have to like have a pattern for how you like. You have to mm -hmm. use the key to figure out how you're going to switch the stickers, right? So yep. Yep. this yellow, I'm going to turn it to white because the key is telling me I need to turn it to white, mm -hmm. and that's what the key is for. Is like telling you what sticker, what color to change your sticker to. Yeah, now the key is it, it informs what steps, the exact steps you do to reverse that to get back to the solved mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So that was uh, the question that I felt like we didn't answer well last week. Hopefully the encryption, you know, hardcore people out there that listen to us and rolled their eyes at last week will be like, okay, these guys did their homework. Yeah. Yeah. One, one small thing, it's 256 bit, not 256 byte. 256 byte would be pretty intense. Maybe we're going to need that in 10 years. Right, right, right. But for now, it's it's bit. And so maybe just to finish up then with with TLS is so we've so we've used this public key encryption to create a unique per session symmetric key. And so now that's what that's what the two parties are going to use for for encrypting. So what they're going to do is they've each one of these messages that goes across is going to be encrypted using symmetric encryption using that shared secret and because they've already established the they've shared that 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 secret using public key and encryption. Now they can just safely go ahead and, re and encrypt and decrypt these messages for as long as the session lasts. And again, as you mentioned, very, very fast. And that's why we do symmetric encryption for the actual bulk of the messages. And we use public key encryption for sharing the secret that's going to be used for that. The third part of this TLS was in the integrity, right? So that's verifying that these messages haven't been tampered with, as well as like authenticating that the message originated from who I thought it did. And so that's done with a by signing the messages with a message authentication code or Mac, or even more specifically an HMAC. So it's a it's a hashed key message authentication code. And so what this does is it's it's basically it's using hashing like we talked about previously. So it 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 hashes the message, it combines that hash with the secret key that was negotiated during the TLS handshake. And the result is a is a, a short value, right? That's sent alongside with the messages. And that is what can now be used by the other party to, to verify that one, that it hasn't been changed, and that two, it actually is coming from who I think it is because it was it also combined that hash with the key. 
Right. I think we're signing. I think we're not going to get out of TLS today because because I want to also add a little bit to what you just said about the signing. Mm -hmm. um, that was another thing last week that I felt that I kind of stumbled around on. I was like, yeah, there's some sort of thing that you're using the private key, and, you know, to add to your message, and that's how signing works. Well, you did. You just started down the road of explaining how signing works, and I think that I can just add a little bit more to it. So yeah, we have two sides of digital signature that happen. And you talked about the sender side. So the sender has a message that they're going to send over to the receiver. And they, they send that message just directly, right? But they also take that message and they run it through a hash, hash function. And that you just said that that was the HMAC function. And that creates that short little thing because hash functions just turn an arbitrary length input into a specified length output that's much shorter usually. So they run it through the hash function and the outcome is called a message digest. And that, that's that. What did you call it though? You had a different name for it. It's uh, you'll, you'll see it called both a, a hashed value or a digest. Okay. So we have this message digest that's just the short outcome of the hash function. And then, then you encrypt that, like the sender will encrypt that with their private key, which means nobody can read it but them. And this, this is actually something that's a little weird to me. I, I just never have really looked at it that carefully, but I guess private keys and public keys, either one of them can be used to encrypt. Typically in, in asymmetric encryption, you know, people use your public key to encrypt something to send to you. But I guess you can also encrypt with, and then you use your own private key to decrypt. But I guess you can also encrypt with a private key. I guess they're just a number. So there's no reason you can't use a number. You know, I'll just use this number instead of that number to, to do my encryption. Once the sender encrypts that message digest, that's now called a signed digest. And they tack that onto the front of the message and send it to the receiver. So now that the receiver has a signed digest and a message. So then the receiver takes the message, runs it through a hash function, and now they, they also have a message digest. It should be, should be the same as the message digest that the sender created. And then they take the signed digest and they decrypt it with the sender's public key. So I guess these keys can be used either direction, which is wild. I did not know that. They decrypt with the public key, and now they they should have that same message digest. They compare the hash the message digest to the message digest, and if they're the same, boom, you trust that the sender is who they say they are, or not who they say they are, but that they that they have the public key or the private key that they say they do. I was I have to be so specific about that, and then somebody somebody along the way one time made a big deal about private keys not identifying a person but just being private keys like they don't just because rich says i'm rich and i because i have this private key that the, you know if steve got rich's private key then steve could pretend to be rich private key is is not like proof of identity it's only proof of private key right it's a it's again it's part of that that key pair secret right mm -hmm. so and, and what you just described is definitely like code signing in general mm-hmm I think just a nuance is like with TLS, it's a, it's a little bit modified there. You know, it's not, I think the, the, the term that you're wondering about, it's a message authentication code, MAC. And that's, a, it's a little bit different with TLS, but in general, it's the same principle where it's using some secret and not just the hash function, but some secret. And by using the secret, you can then also verify who it's coming from and that you can trust it. And that goes into, that goes into part of it. Cool. So maybe, yeah, yeah. Cause I think in, T in TLS, it's not setting up the, they're not, the client is not sharing a public key, private key pair. It doesn't have a public key, private key pair that it's using with the server, right? It's just the server has a public uh, okay. key, private key pair, right? So okay. this Mac yeah. thing, it's, it's using, I, I believe it uses the symmetric key as the secret, Mm -hmm. um, and so when it hashes, it, it uses the ha the hash is used to verify that the message hasn't been hasn't been tampered with, and then it uses the secret, saying like, "Hey, this is the only the secret is only known between us." So if if you use if you throw the secret in there as like basically salt, mm -hmm. then I know that it came from you, right? But I, it's not encrypting it necessarily, but it's kind of the same principle. Versus got it. that makes sense since you've already established that connection and you've got a symmetric key encryption going, if you can just prove that you've got that symmetric key with your as part of your message, then mm -hmm. that whole thing goes faster. Yes. Like you don't have to do that cuz I think what I just described, which is digital signatures in general, is probably not a fast thing. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, there's the the over you you have to have the infrastructure in place for having publishing the public key part of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and managing that so that's where like on, something on the web would get would get quite onerous 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I like about it, though, what I think is cool and the thing, the thing that's worth remembering is that digital signatures work the same way as passwords do. Like there's this, this secret that, no, that the person verifying the signature can't know and is not allowed to know, and that's that private key. But they can make use of it to do a comparison, just like a password. The, you know, a password, like the server that receives your password is not supposed to know your password. They just, the server only knows that you've, the thing that you're using as a password matches this other thing that they have, that the server has in its database. So I think that's, that's a cool thing. And it's another use of hashing as part of this whole world of encryption. Mm -hmm. Yep, indeed. Well, Chris, is there anything else you wanted to say about TLS to wrap it up? No, I think I think that that definitely covers TLS. We'd we'd plan to talk about the Virgil SDK, which is an SDK for end-to-end -end encryption. So this is where two parties can establish a secure communication link with the server between them, and the server never sees unencrypted messages. Right. So it's this is like. The what's WhatsApp, right? Secure messaging with WhatsApp. So with mm -hmm. WhatsApp, like on their server, like the messages go through their servers, but when as it goes through the servers, it's completely encrypted and WhatsApp can't read it, right? That's a mm -hmm. key part of their value proposition. So mm -hmm. Virgil SDK is is a code library that allows developers to build this into it. And we can walk through this and, and understand like how that works, and how you can kind of keep keep this encrypted all the way end to end. And then also the the multi-party aspect to it. Like, how do you do this with one to many? And so maybe we can talk about that next time. Okay, that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, this was really informative. And I, it's, I knew that this week was going to be more fun than last week because last week, you know, there's just some ground that we had to tread to, to lay this framework out. But now we can really use it and, and get into it deeply. So super fun. And we'll talk next week. All right, see you then. Thanks. Later. Later, Rich. Bye. Well, dear listener, you made it to the end. We appreciate your time and invite you to continue the conversation with us online. This episode, along with show notes and other valuable resources, is available at mobicast.fm forward slash 74. If you have any questions or additional insights, we encourage you to leave us a comment there. Thank you, and we'll see you again next week.